On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. May God help us to understand his word. Back in 2017, Hilary and I were both awarded the Cliff College Certificate in Contextual Theology. That was really quite a grand title for what was basically a 10-day trip to the Holy Land, followed by the writing of a 3,000-word assignment. Hilary's assignment got awarded a grade B, but mine was only a grade C, even though it was only a few marks less than Hillary's. When we were in Jerusalem, we visited a place known as the Garden Tomb. The garden is about half an acre, or perhaps just under a quarter of a hectare. It overlooks a hill, next slide please, Anne, which could be Skull Hill, where Jesus was crucified. I've actually added the red oval around just to help you see the sort of face features there. In that garden area, there is an ancient tomb. It's probably not the one that Jesus was laid in, although it would have been quite similar. We went into the empty tomb and saw where bodies had been laid. And then as we turned to go out, there was a sign which read, he is not here. He has risen. Those words are what the angels uh, said to the women on that glorious resurrection morning as recorded in Matthew 28, 6. After reading, he is not here. He has risen. We then walked out into this beautiful garden area. And I was thinking, you know, it was such a wonderful place to be there and to celebrate Jesus' resurrection. And as I was thinking that, I just had a sense of Jesus whispering to me, although this is a great place to celebrate my resurrection, my risen presence can be experienced just as much anywhere else. His risen presence can be celebrated and experienced here today just as much as even on that first Easter Sunday when the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Our first key point, next slide please Anne, is new life for Jesus. After his terrible suffering and death, Father raised him to life eternal. From John 20, 20, we read, the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And those are our key words. The key words come from that phrase. The whole line is, the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And the title I've been given for this sermon comes from that verse. They saw the Lord. The followers of Jesus discovered that the tomb was empty and Jesus' corpse has never been found. 
And the risen with Jesus was seen first on that Easter Sunday by Mary when he appeared to her in the garden, then later to Cleopas and another as they were going back to Emmaus and then to others in the evening. The Gospel reading included those words, or began with the words, on the evening of the first day of the week. Yes, on that very first Easter Sunday evening, the disciples had gathered together. They had locked the doors in fear of the Jews. They must have been so afraid that what had happened to Jesus, crucifixion, could also happen to them. I think it's amazing that any of them were actually still in Jerusalem. I think if I'd been one of the disciples, I'm not sure that I would have risked staying put in Jerusalem, especially if my home was elsewhere, maybe sort of around more Galilee. I think I would have been more like Cleopas and companion. I would have thought of escaping to a safer place. As we know, different people respond to grief differently. Perhaps for Cleopas and companion, they needed just more time by themselves. Whereas in, yes, in times of grief, some people need that time by themselves. Whereas others need to be sharing much more with others in their grief. And perhaps that's why all those followers of Jesus, most of them did stay put and were meeting together because they had a shared sense of grief. It wasn't a pity party, but they were being, would have been drawn together in sharing their grief over the crucifixion and in sharing their confusion as how come the tomb's now empty? Where's his body gone? We read that even though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them. In the parallel passage in Luke 24, 37, we read, they were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. I think that would have been quite a natural reaction to suddenly seeing the one they knew had been crucified and buried in a tomb. Now, I'm guessing that if Jesus suddenly appeared here now, that we would all be somewhat startled. Even for those of us who believe he is alive, we would still feel quite startled if he suddenly appeared in front of us. He then said to them, peace be with you. I wonder if he needed to try to somewhat calm them down, to be able to then minister to them. He then showed them his hands and his side. As he did that, they must have so quickly realised that it was Jesus and that he was alive. No wonder we then read the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Seeing him must have convinced them that he was alive. So secondly, new life for Jesus' followers. When he had been crucified, his followers must have suffered so much immense shock and grief. The one they had put all their hope in was dead and buried. And they were scared. After Mary Magdalene had found the tomb empty, she went to the disciples and she must have been quite despairing when she said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they've put him. Just a little while later, after seeing him, she then went to the disciples again. But it must have been so different then. There must have been so much joy she felt when she then said to them, I have seen the Lord. Her despair turned to delight when she experienced the risen Lord. New life for Jesus gave new life to his followers. Fear turned to faith. 
Grief turned to joy. Helplessness turned to hopefulness. Although they saw the Lord is the title I was given for this sermon, I've given it a subtitle, Experiencing the Risen Lord. Even though they saw the Lord, it was actually their experience of him alive that transformed their own lives. They must have come out of that room so different, so different from when they'd gone in, because the resurrection of Jesus gave new life not just to him, but to his followers as well. Those early followers were so privileged to see the risen Lord, but we're not likely to see him in the way that they did. Yet each one of us can experience him. And it's experiencing the risen Lord that is touching and transforming millions of lives day after day. So thirdly, new life for us. Nearly 2,000 years since Jesus' resurrection, he is appearing to many people in dreams and visions. And that's resulting in many of them giving their lives to him. Once a month, I take part in a Miracles and Healing Night organised by the International Association of Healing Ministries. People can join in through Zoom and receive Christian prayer from us. A couple of months ago, a lady from India suddenly appeared in our Zoom room. Her background was being in a Hindu family, and just a few months ago, she had experienced an incredible vision of Jesus Christ, which resulted in her becoming a Christian. Her visionary experience of Jesus convinced her that he was alive and resulted in her committing her life to being a Christian. And she came to us for prayer because she wanted help to renounce all the bad spiritual stuff from Hinduism so that she could experience the fullness of new life in Jesus Christ. It was such a privilege to hear her testimony and to pray for her to be able to flourish in her newfound Christian faith. As she was sharing something of her visionary experience of Jesus, I was thinking, I've been a Christian for 45 years and I've never seen anything like that. But even if we don't see the risen Lord, we can experience him. You may well hear more about that tonight as Simon uh, preaches on the story of Thomas, the story which follows on from this in John's Gospel. Our experiences of the risen Lord can touch and transform our lives just as powerfully as an awesome vision can. Earlier I mentioned that in the garden, tomb in Jerusalem, I had that sense of Jesus saying to me, although this is a great place to celebrate my resurrection, my risen presence can be experienced just as much anywhere else. His risen presence can be experienced by each one of you today, just as much as the disciples experienced him on that first Easter Sunday. If you're not experiencing the risen Lord, you can experience his life-transforming presence and power. Through giving our sins and ourselves to Jesus Christ, we can experience him personally and powerfully. We can experience his forgiveness and friendship, his love and his light, his help and his healing. And that awesome assurance that when our time on earth comes to an end, he will carry us through death 
and into glorious eternal life in heaven. A divinity school invited one of the greatest minds to lecture in their theological education centre. And one year, a guest lecturer was a professor and he spoke for two and a half hours about the resurrection of Jesus being false. Don't worry, I'm not planning to preach for two and a half hours this morning. The professor quoted scholar after scholar and book after book. He concluded that since there was no such thing as the historical resurrection, the religious traditions of the church were groundless mumble-jumble because it was based on a resurrection of Jesus, which in fact hadn't actually happened. So uh, Jesus wasn't alive, so really the whole Christian, all of Christianity was based on a falsehood. He then asked if there were any questions. After about 30 seconds or so, an old preacher stood up. Dr. Professor, I've got one question, he said, and all eyes turned towards him. He reached into his lunch bag and pulled out an apple and began eating. Crunch, munch. My question is a simple question. Crunch, munch. I can't recite the scriptures in the original Hebrew. Crunch, munch. I don't know nothing about Niebuhr and Heidegger. Crunch, munch. He then finished the apple, put it back into his bag. And he said, all I want to know is this. This apple I just ate, was it bitter or was it sweet? The professor paused for a moment and answered in exemplary scholarly fashion, I cannot possibly answer your question because I haven't tasted your apple. The white-haired preacher turned and said to the professor, Neither have you tasted my Jesus. Neither have you tasted my Jesus. The thousand plus in the auditorium couldn't contain themselves. They, they erupted in applause and cheers and the professor thanked his audience and quickly left. Have you tasted the risen Jesus? Are you tasting the risen Jesus. In Psalm 38, 4, we read, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. If you've never tasted the risen Jesus, then I encourage you to repent of your sin and invite Jesus into your life. Or if you've lost his taste, his flavour from your life, Turn to him afresh. Renew your commitment to him. And if you are experiencing the risen Lord, then go on enjoying new life in him. You can taste and enjoy the risen Lord today and every day and forever. Our Bible reading didn't stop with the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. It didn't stop with their own personal experience of him. He then commissioned them to continue his ministry. So fourthly, new life for others. In verse 21 we read, Again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I I'm sending you. And with that, Jesus breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Some people think that was John's description of Pentecost. But Luke's description of Pentecost is so much more dramatic. I believe that on that first Easter Sunday evening, as Jesus breathed over them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit, that they did experience more Holy Spirit than they had previously experienced, but that they were not filled with the Holy Spirit 
until Pentecost, 50 days later. There's a sense in which when on the Easter Sunday evening, when Jesus breathed over them and said, receive the Holy Spirit, he gave them enough Holy Spirit to hang in there for the next 50 days. And then at Pentecost, they received the fullness of God's Spirit, who then sent them out to continue the wonderful ministry of Jesus. Once we become followers of Jesus Christ, he wants to breathe his Holy Spirit into our lives. He wants to fill us with God's Spirit every day so that we can experience the risen Lord every day. In Romans 8, 11, we read that the Spirit of, of him who raised Christ from the dead lives in us. Yes, the power that raised Jesus Christ from death to life, that same power can live and move in each one of us. Every day, I ask the Lord to fill me with his spirit, to empower my work and witness. Jesus Christ wants to send us out in the power of the spirit, so that through our work and witness, many more people will experience the risen Lord for themselves. We come to church, not just to worship God, not just to hear his word. We come so that we get refreshed and renewed to serve him during the rest of the week. We need the Holy Spirit to be empowering our words and works so that more people around us will experience the risen Lord touching and transforming their lives. In conclusion, the final slide, please. The subtitle of this sermon is Experiencing the Risen Lord. And our four key points have been new life for Jesus, new life for his disciples, new life for us, new life for others. If you're not experiencing the risen Lord, then I encourage you to give your sin and yourself to him and be touched by his risen presence and glorious power. And if you're not experiencing the life-giving breath of God's Spirit, then I encourage you to ask Jesus to breathe over you. You can pray something along the lines of, Lord Jesus, you breathed on your followers and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, breathe more of your Holy Spirit into me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. As I was praying about this service, I sensed the Lord saying that there could be people here this morning who don't yet know him as Saviour, as Lord, who are not yet experiencing the risen Lord and who want to. If you're not experiencing the risen Lord, and want to experience him, then I invite you to silently pray the following prayer after me. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, I believe that you died on the cross for my sins, and so I give all my sins to you, Lord Jesus. You died so that I can be forgiven. Forgive me, Lord Jesus, for all my sin. Cleanse me from guilt and shame. Lord Jesus, I dedicate my life to you. And Lord Jesus, breathe your life-giving spirit into me. 
Lord Jesus, may I experience you in life-transforming ways. Amen.